Well, welcome everybody. This is uh, the second part of the Command Basics series. It is effective transacting and contract to close here with the Keller Williams Southeast region. And so we're going to be going through, of uh, course, Command today. We're going to be talking about some great things you can do in it. And really, we're going to answer probably a lot of questions that you have around uh, opportunities, how it integrates with DocuSign, which we're not going to really get into DocuSign itself. So it's like DocuSign super light on that. And, um, but tomorrow we'll actually be teaching on DocuSign. So if you have questions around DocuSign, that's fine. We will get those answered tomorrow. Yay, we got some more faces on here. I just love seeing smiling faces. If anybody here knows what the, um, the DISC personality assessment is, so it's like the dominance, influence, steadiness, and compliance. I have a lot of I in my personality, which means I like people, I like faces, I like being sociable. So uh, I like cameras, because then it feels like I'm not, speaking into the void here. Uh, definitely gonna be a day of interaction too. So uh, for our session here, feel free to come off mute. We have a small-ish group today. And so if you need to ask a question, feel feel free to ask, yeah, we got some more faces. I love it, I love it. So I'm excited to have you guys here. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Patrick Malden, Director of Technology and Resources here for the Keller Williams Southeast region, which is all of the state of Georgia, most of the state of Alabama, and most of the state of Tennessee. And as a whole, you guys represent almost 16,000 agents. Y'all are the largest region in Keller Williams. It's pretty remarkable how many, how many of you folks there are. Um, I've been in this uh, industry now a little over 10 years, uh, currently living in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm from Birmingham, Alabama, though, where I, where I grew up and lived for most of my life. And um, I'm a total nerd. I've got a, I've got a wife and two kids, a uh, seven-month-old at home, and an eight-year-old. So uh, never lack for something to do in that space, and it's a whole lot of fun, but I'm a business nerd, I'm a systems nerd, and I enjoy most in this role is really being able to help folks like you grow and scale their business, and so that's what we're going to do today. Real quick on classes this month. So yesterday we did Command Basics 1. If you did not sign up or attend, when I send out the follow-up email on this, if you would like a recording of that class, just uh, email me back, and I will make sure that you get a copy of that. Uh, that's where we kind of went over the 30,000 foot view of command, how it fits in your real estate business. And we did some simple things like create a contact and start a smart plan. Uh, today, we're going to be looking more at the transactional side and keeping track of your pipeline. Uh, tomorrow, DocuSign, like I said, command for teams is going to be on the 18th. So if you have a real estate team or on a real estate team or curious about building a real estate team, uh, come on the 18th and we will walk you through how that works inside the command space. Uh, the day after that is going to be automating your life with smart plans, which is going to show you how to use. There's a specific smart plan that I built for you guys that covers about 75% of a 36 touch campaign. If you follow through on the smart plan outlined, basically about every 12 contacts you put in your database and you follow up with on a consistent basis will equal a closed unit every year. I want that to sink in. 12 contacts can equal closed units. So depending on what your price point is, this could be hundreds of thousands of dollars just waiting to be discovered. And so um, we talk about how that system actually works on the 19th. And then of course, on the 25th, we're going to do close more sales with consumer, which goes through the consumer side of command and how you use the, uh, the mobile app and your website. Not, it's not a class on websites. It's mostly on the mobile app, but we do talk a little bit about what that looks like. So you do have something in your pocket that is basically like the uh, Zillow that is branded to you. And so I want to be able to help you guys be able to use that at a high level. Okay, so this is one of the most important things, and I, I've added this slide to the beginning of every class. Who here has their command app downloaded? Is everybody okay? I see, I see one hand, I see two hands. If you don't, yep. Awesome. We're going to take it. We're going to take pause real quick. And I did this yesterday. So if anybody was here with yesterday and you, 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 you were in for the pause, you're going to get it today. I'm sorry. Um, go to the app store. If you're on, uh, you know, if you're on an iPhone, go to the, uh, you know, the Apple app store. If you're on an Android device, go to Google Play, download KW command, the command app, and just go ahead and download that and get logged in. You're going to hear me talk about things. Oftentimes I refer back to the app and it is, it's an amazing app. If there's something you can do in under two minutes in command, they plan on putting it into this app. So you need to have it. You can do great things from it, like send text messages, make phone calls, track activities, see what tasks you have to do for the day, add contacts, trigger smart plans, 
share your consumer app, take a look at your active business and the pipeline, get notifications. I mean, there's there are all kinds of great things. Awesome. We got a lot of hands up. This is good. Okay. Making sure the message gets out there because I still think it is one of our uh, most powerful tools that we have at our disposal. So what are we covering today? So we're going to talk about best practices uh, when it comes to workflow from contact to contract. We're going to talk about how to create managed opportunities. Uh, we're going to talk briefly on opportunity checklists. This is an often overlooked feature inside command. We're going to talk very basically about how DocuSign Rooms fits into this. Now, you can choose whatever document management platform you want. DocuSign is a partner we have at Keller Williams. It's a great platform. Uh, I, I have enjoyed using it myself. And when I made my home purchase here in Atlanta, when me and my wife did, we, they did all our documents through DocuSign. It's very simple from both sides, from the agent side and from the consumer side to use. And then we're also going to show you how to turn in compliance as well. However, caveat on compliance and getting paid. It's different every market center. For you Alabama folks, there's a procedure for getting paid in Alabama. For you Georgia folks, there's a different procedure for getting paid in Georgia. And so same for Tennessee. Tennessee and Alabama are a little kind of more the same, but Georgia, you guys have this thing, uh, or I say we, y'all, it's we. I'm living in Georgia now. I forget sometimes I live in Atlanta. Um, but in Georgia, you can get, do pay at the table and things like that. So you're always going to want to defer to what your local leadership and your broker says is okay in your state. Okay, so just putting that out there. I'll give some basic process on that, though. Of course, as always, it is about progress, not perfection. So take what uh, pieces you can out of today and um, don't, don't get upset with yourself. You don't learn everything. It is 100% okay. I just want you to come away today with at least one or two things that you can put into action tomorrow. That's the whole point of today. We're also living in a crazy market. I don't know if anybody's noticed that yet, uh, but chaos is good news. And the most millionaires are made in the shifts of any kind of market, no matter what it is. Real estate's where a lot of the wealth in the world is tied up. And so chaos is good news. But when, when times are crazy, embrace that. I kind of have this slide up here for myself because there are some days that the chaos kind of kind of gets to me. And I have to remind myself, this is a good thing. Stasis equals death and chaos can actually equal life. The universe did not begin with a whimper, it began with a bang. So uh, embrace that. Okay, so I'm just curious, if anybody was here yesterday, or even if you weren't here yesterday, can anyone here name, or who here would like to name one of the six personal perspectives, if you remember that? Nobody knew the test was going to be at the beginning. Is the 80-20 one of them? Yes, it is. Absolutely. 80-20 principle is going to be one of those. Thank you so much for sharing, Ebony. Um, so 80-20 principle is the Pareto's principle that 20% of your activities give you 80% of your results. This shows up in a lot of different spaces, and it does show up in real estate too. The six personal perspectives, especially with us going into a skills-based market, is a great thing to embrace. This is something Gary wrote years ago. It's in many of our classes. It used to be at the beginning of every single class, which is why I've added a little segment on all of mine. So if you come to all the classes this month, just buckle up because you're gonna hear about the six personal perspectives every single time you're in a class. And the reason why is because it matters. The reason that I, that I continue to harp on this is because it matters. And so these six perspectives are commitment to self-mastery. What are my weaknesses? What are my strengths? And I'm going to work towards being a master. Commitment to 80-20. We just talked about that. 20% of your activities get 80% of your results. And 80% activity in real estate is getting business cards. A 20% activity is calling and talking to people. Okay? So these are, these are two different things. Business cards may not equal direct business, but getting on the phone and talking to people and setting appointments will. Moving from E to P, E is your entrepreneurial state. That's I'm shooting from the hip. I'm just doing what feels right. P is being purposeful. That means I have a plan in place and I'm going to follow the plan with systems, models, tools, and people. And you're going to be able to grow because of that. Being learning-based, y'all are here. So I hope that you're learning-based. So we're not going to go, well, it just, that doesn't work. And I, I can't make, you know, I'm not going to learn anymore. I know everything. No, you make being learning part of your action plan. Removing your limiting beliefs. I, I've said this before in other classes that um, for the remainder of this class, all things are possible. When I mean all things are possible, by the end of this class, 
I am going to choose to believe that we could cure cancer, world hunger, uh, a, you know, any, any of these other great things, war around the world, all of those could be gone by the end of this class. We could come up with the answers for them. So we are removing all limiting beliefs. You can do anything in your business. You can do anything in your own life. And then being accountable. And the accountable piece, I think, is important to go a little deeper on right now because, you know, you, I, I get on social media and I see some of these Facebook groups and for real estate agents, and I see a lot of what's going on on the left side. That is that victim mindset. And so people who are accountable, they seek reality, they acknowledge that reality, they own what's going on, they find solutions, and they just get on with it. Some days are going to suck, and it's you go, wow, that really sucks. What do I do? But victims, they don't seek reality. They don't look for the answer there. They fight reality vehemently. They deny everything that is going on. They blame other people. It's so-and-so's fault. It's so-and-so's fault. It's this person's fault. It's, uh, you know, this policy decision or that policy decision. Um, they make excuses for themselves. Well, I can't do this today because of this, 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 and this. And, and uh, they just kind of wait and hope. And I want you guys to hear me. Hope is not a strategy. Hope is not a strategy. And I don't care what industry uh, or what position you're, you're working in. Hope is never a strategy to move forward. And so don't be a victim, be the accountable person. And accountable doesn't necessarily mean, did you do your calls today? Did you do your calls today? Although that can be a part of it. It's just owning what you've got. So we talked yesterday about some systems and models. We talked about the difference between a data bank and a database. We went over the marketing profile. We set up a simple smart plan. And in the follow-up email, I sent you guys the success model from Ignite which if you haven't taken that class yet, I highly recommend that you take Ignite. Um, and it essentially goes through, you have 10 people in your database, you have 10 conversations, 10 handwritten notes, and you spend every day enriching yourself with education. That's the model that's in Ignite for you to do for your daily activities. But I'm here today to help you guys close a very important circle. And so this is Patrick, this is not a KWU thing, this is not a Gary Keller drawing. Uh, he would do a much better job at this, but this is a Patrick Malden drawing of a simplified real estate transaction. And so essentially, someone has an interest in real estate, you provide value to them, you uh, show or list properties, negotiate on their behalf, make a sale, hopefully they're happy, you stay in relationship, and you receive referrals. Now, curious here, how many of you think that this circle works perfectly all the time? Is this just how it works? Or do you think we have some challenges in that space? Does anybody want to take a guess where most of the challenges actually happen? I always phrase this question wrong. So you're going to have to bear with me on this. But when the National Association of Realtors does surveys of, of the general public. What percentage of those people do you believe say they want to do business with their previous realtor again? 60. 60, okay. Anybody else? 80. 88. Okay. It varies year to year, but it's somewhere between 75 and 80%, somewhere, somewhere around that. It kind of it kind of goes vacillates around a little bit. Um, what percentage of people when they survey them use that agent more than once? 90. You think that 90% use their agent again? Okay. I did. <laughs> okay. Who else? Who else? Let's get one other. Uh 75%. I'm sorry, Ebony, what was that? I would say about 60%. How would it make you guys feel if I told you it's more like 20%? So only about 20% of people use their realtor again. So I'll tell you what breaks down in there is that stay in relationship piece breaks. And that's why we, got, we have to start early to build a system between the transaction itself and the pipeline and that staying in relationship. So we're going to go through, we are starting very early in the process. And the reason why I kind of give you guys a visual about this is because when we talk about the smart plans class and consumer later in the month, 
that stay in relationship to someone has an interest in real estate again, that quarter of the clock up there, that's the part we're going to work on. The part we're going to work on today, though, is someone has an interest, you're providing value, showing them properties, negotiating, making a sale, okay? So we're working on kind of the half, the, the right half of the circle today. But 75% of people want to use their agent again, only about 20 to 25% actually do use their agent again. That's a big gap. And actually what steps in the way is we have third parties, we have disintermediary technologies like Zillow and Realtor and other lead generation sources. However, if you stay in relationship with them and continue to provide value more than just the transaction itself, then, um, then you will get a higher percentage of those people back as uh, future clients. And so this is kind of my contract to close workflows, kind of how I think about it. And so you're going to hear me talk about opportunities and command. And uh, an opportunity, as I'd like to define it for you guys, is a potential piece of business, okay? So an opportunity is not created in command when you have paperwork to turn in. Okay, I want you to let that one set aside. It's not when you have paperwork to uh, turn in. We are going into a market where you may speak with someone today who's highly interested and qualified to either purchase a house or is ready to sell their house. And that closing may not happen for 90 days. So let's see what well, we're in October right now. So that means November, December, January. So anything that you guys work on right now, as far as lead generation, is probably going to show up in January. So that's why we have to load the front end of our business all the time. And what opportunities is good at is, is helping you get the clarity around that pipeline. So where in the process are people? And uh, how do I continue to? put people in the places that they need to be so that I can have a successful business. And so it all starts with you identify a need. So one of us has a conversation and it's a two-way conversation about real estate. Not everybody's going to go in your opportunities. You go to a bridal show for uh, and trying to get first-time homebuyers and newlyweds. You don't take the database of people that you got from the bridal show on the giveaway and put them in your database as opportunities. You may put them in your database. You may put them on a drip campaign, but you do not create an opportunity because you haven't had a two-way conversation with them yet about real estate. But as you talk to them, well, you know, we're getting married in four months and, you know, we really wanted to move to Brookhaven in Atlanta and fantastic. How about this? Would it be okay if I go ahead and start pulling properties from that area and we can start looking at them? We can go ahead and make sure you guys are pre-qualified and make sure everything's good to go. You say you're getting married in four months. When do you guys think you're gonna move? Oh, your lease is up in six months, awesome. Whatever that process looks like, you had that two-way conversation, you can go ahead and create an opportunity. Now, that one would be a little far out in that example. It'd be six, seven, eight, nine months maybe. But if it's at least in a 90-day window, create an opportunity. And, I, and the way I like to word it is a high level of intent. So you think there's a high level of intent in that 90-day uh, window. You create an opportunity. Once you do that, you're putting them in your sales pipeline and command. And command is actually going to help you calculate how much that opportunity is worth. So you can see how much money you have coming in the next 90 days, which is really cool, right? Bills kind of come every month. It's good to know what you have coming up. Just putting that out there. Uh, so you create that opportunity and you place it in what is called cultivate stage. And the cultivate stage is where it's going to sit until you get an appointment with them to sign some sort of representation agreement, either a listing agreement or a buyer representation or whatever you call it in your state. And then at that point, you would actually move them into an active phase. But while you're uh, while they're, you're following up with them on a regular basis, you nurture them. So you may have a smart plan for those people who you moved into an opportunity. You may um, You may just be pulling out your command app every day, seeing what cultivate opportunities you have and just calling those people, you know, like, hey, what's up, April? How are you doing today? I know we talked a couple of weeks ago about those properties over in Brookhaven. Uh, are you guys still looking at that? Fantastic. Here's some things we need to do to get ready for that. Or, oh, the situation's changed. You guys are ready to just hop out of the apartment. Fantastic. Well, let's go ahead and get this rolling. Let's go. I, I can get some showing set up for this weekend, whatever that is. Once they are ready to sign an agreement, though, and they're ready to actually do something, then it's going to um, it's going to become an active 
opportunity, and then you can go into DocuSign and fill out whatever paperwork you need. So DocuSign is actually connected to the opportunity. You'll go in the opportunity, you'll hit start transaction, it creates a room in DocuSign, and then those two things are synced together. Changes you make to the opportunity can get pushed through to DocuSign. Changes that are made in DocuSign can get pushed back to the opportunity. They become linked at that point. And then once that's done, you can say, you know, in the, in the closing happens and everything, you can submit your signed paperwork to the market center. So creating the opportunity on the front end also saves you time on the back end because you're not having to go, oh my gosh, I got to write a contract now. Let me log into command. Let me make an opportunity. You've already got it. You go, cool. Let me go to my opportunity, start transaction. You're kind of already off to the races in that. And so we are going to walk through that and show you guys what that actually looks like to be able to start from a blank opportunity. And you guys are going to be doing some exercises as well. So I know some of y'all were here yesterday. And so if you were here yesterday, you probably already have yourself as a contact in your database. Okay. I know, I know we have a couple of people who did it. Uh, if you don't have a contact yourself in the database, first thing that we're going to do, is you're going to go up to contacts real quick. And I want you to add yourself. And all we need for this exercise is name, phone number, and email address. So if you want to skip all the rest of it later, that's fine. So going to the little, the little person icon there on the left side, we click on that. We come here to the top right. We hit add contact and just add yourself to your database. I'm already in my database like a million times for different reasons, but I'll just kind of show you what I'm talking about so you guys can follow along. And then we'll give everybody, uh, I did not mean to click on that button right there. So remove relationship. And then we are good to go. And you scroll down to the bottom and you hit create. So if anybody's following along, which you should be, um, go ahead and make sure that you are in there. Now, once we end up creating this contact, we're going to be able to use this, this contact of yourself to create an opportunity that we can uh, that we can play around and we can test with. Okay. It's the same thing that I'll talk about. I've talked about with smart plans, the same thing here with opportunities. You just you need yourself in as a contact so you can play. It just gives you a sandbox to play in. Okay, so once you've got that completed, we just come to the bottom, we would hit create. I already have myself in my database, so it's okay. We don't have to mess with that. Let's see. I don't see your screen share. Am I sharing the wrong screen, guys? Are y'all seeing my command? Okay. I had a couple of people yesterday that were having issues with it. And I wonder if Zoom's got something going on. So I'm going to turn my share back off and turn it back on. I think there were a couple of folks that had to, it says loading screen. There are a couple of folks that had to log out of the uh, out and then log back in. So you may want to do that. It could have to do with your connection. I do have a hardwired fiber here, but um, every once in a while, the receiving connection can can cause issues with screen shares because you use a lot of bandwidth. I see you and it. Okay. If you're having trouble seeing my desktop, just leave the um, leave the Zoom and then come back in and then I will just, I'll let you back in the room. Okay, so, so if we're here, I could go to my test contact that I have. You would pull yourself up in your database. I'll go to test Patrick. Let's see, I see you in command. Um, and uh, if you can see, I have a lot of opportunities connected to this contact. That's because I've taught this class a bunch of times and I keep forgetting to clear these out. But there's two ways we can create an opportunity. We can either create it from here or we can create it from opportunities. And so if you're creating it from here, you would just click on the opportunities tab right here and you would say create opportunity. And then we would fill out that basic information. Awesome, I'm glad it fits a couple of you guys. Once we've got this pulled up, we can fill in some very simple information. The easiest example to go through on this is typically a listing. And so that's what we'll end up creating. Let's go ahead and fill it out on this side if you're already here. If not, I'll show you how it works on the opportunities side. And you can do it with the mobile app, which is awesome, which is awesome. So if you've got this pulled up, I'm going to select my correct market center. I have Birmingham Hoover. 
opportunity type listing client, it's going to automatically fill that in because we came from a contact record. Opportunity name, I'll just call it one, two, three, four, main street or man basic two. And then there's a field here for custom tags. Now we're not going to worry about custom tags right now. There's some cool tag systems you can do with opportunities. I'll briefly discuss those at the end, but for now, just kind of skip that. Okay, so we put a price in there. Actually, we'll, we'll do 325. The commission rate, whatever you believe that that commission might be. What it's actually going to do, what command's going to do is it's going to take the estimated listing price you put in here. You may not know what there, what the listing is going to be yet, but if you know basically where the neighborhood is, you can you can pull comps and kind of get an idea. And then the commission rate, that is going to be up to what is you're planning to put in the listing agreement. Command will do the math and it'll actually give you a gross commission income number that'll go into your pipeline in a minute. So since we just had a two-way conversation with someone and we are not going to actively make a contract at this point, it would just be a cultivate and you can just leave it and watch. Now, cultivate appointment and active, these things you cannot change, but inside of cultivate, there's watch, nurture, hot, six months, eight months. Those options may not be in yours. Those are all things that you can edit on your own. Okay, and I'll show you guys where that is in a minute. But for now, just keep the defaults. Most people don't need beyond the defaults unless they get super granular with like a team or they've got an admin. Once I create that, we've got that uh, opportunity now created and I can actually click into it and start to work within that opportunity. Now, if you've already clicked in your opportunity, leave it there. Don't follow me on this because I just wanna show you all the other place that we can make an opportunity. So inside command, if you ever get lost, that little KW in the top left, if you click it, it's just going to give you like a little fly out and you can go down. You see the little hands right there are going to be the opportunity. So it's like you're making a deal. And under opportunities, mine, I'm, I have a team account connected to mine. So I'm going to actually go to my personal account for this. Uh, we can see that I have, a, um, I have a listing pipeline and I have a buyer pipeline. So it will not allow me to create an opportunity for my contact. Um, Taking a guess, Ebony, are you connected to a team by any chance? No. Okay. We might start, have to circle back around to that because if you're connected to a team, they can, it, they can turn opportunities off. That's a function that is there to be able to make sure that it gets put underneath the team. Okay, so when you're creating the opportunity, have you selected your market center at the top and selected the opportunity type? That's another step you have to make sure that you do. I had someone send me a message on this the other day and I forgot that. It, it, it doesn't, it, it may not give you a pop-up that says, hey, you need to select the opportunity type. Well, um, I take that back. I may, I just click the drop down. I'm a new agent. I just click the drop down and it says that I am in a coaching team A. Yep. It will let you create it in the team. Okay. Yep. It just won't let you create it under an individual account. It's because uh, you're, you're probably in productivity coaching and they're using that to keep track of uh, sales inside the uh, productivity coaching team. So yeah, that's the reason why I asked. Okay. So this is the other way you guys can create it. So when you, if you're in opportunities itself, if you're in the pipeline view here is what I would call this, you can hit create opportunity. Now, of course, it's not gonna populate it with the client, but you can click there and you can type the client's name if you know what it is, fantastic. Or if you don't have a contact for this person, you can even create it right there. So let's see if like, if I was putting Mel in there, let's see, see, I could create a contact. Hey, you're in my database already. How, how is that? You, you must have come to a class before. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but you can actually create the contact from here. So if you forget that, that's a that's something you can do, and it and it's fine. But but we've already created the opportunity. Uh, had, or rather, let me let me rephrase that. Has everybody created their opportunity? Do they? Are we caught up on this? Okay. 
I try to ramble sometimes and go a little deeper on different things to give people the opportunity to catch up. So let's see, yes. Okay. So now that, now that we're here, I'm gonna go back just a little pipeline view here and kind of tell you guys what this is. And then we'll go into the opportunity itself and explain a bit more. So this is the pipeline view of opportunities. You have three pipelines in your opportunities. You have listing opportunities, which means the opportunity to list a specific house. Then you have buyer opportunities, which is the opportunity to work with a buyer to make a purchase. The reason I phrase it that way is you don't have to create a new buyer opportunity for every house they make an offer on. Your opportunity is to work with the buyer, not the property they purchase. So you can keep using that same opportunity over and over again until they finally get something under contract and they're good to go. Where the listing, it's a little bit different. It is, I would say that the listing is tied to the property because most people aren't gonna have like seven different properties. They may work, work with an investor and you're still probably gonna wanna create an opportunity for every property they sell, okay? The third one is leases. Does not apply as much here in the Southeast region. We don't do leases quite at the same level. However, there are a few states that it does. And so just know that that is down here as well. It is a pipeline that you have, but listings and buyers are gonna be the main ones. Now for you Alabama folks who may MEOP a deal, everybody else is going, what the heck is a MEOP? Um, if you MEOP a deal in Alabama, you create two opportunities. So you create a listing opportunity for the list side, you create a buyer opportunity for the uh, purchase side, okay? Just because they're the same person, it's two different sales, technically. And so now that we have that opportunity created, um, over here on the right, you're going to see that we have things like potential income and probable income. So potential income is going to be the whole value of your pipeline. If everything you had closed tomorrow, if everything I had in my listing opportunities closed tomorrow, I'd make 149000 in gross commission income. Heck yeah. All day long, right? My probable income, though, is 79900 That is because I have some cultivates over here, which means the chances of those are closing are far less likely than something that is say in my active phase. These are people that are just, that have kicked the tires. We've had a conversation. They may or may not work with me. They may or may not list their house. Their house may not even be in the condition to be listable yet. I don't even know. Like we haven't, we haven't gotten that far. But these active ones are people that are currently in the MLS and can currently be searched and people can go look at those houses. So there is going to be some fallout that happens in a really good market. It's about 70% uh, list to sell, 70 to 80% list to sell. In the market we've been in, this hyper aggressive seller's market, it was like 98% list to sell. That's why everybody was losing their heads. Well, since rates are going up, that puts the affordability crunch, creates larger inventory. That means that these actives that say I have here, I may only close 60% of them. So command kind of takes those into consideration. Now it doesn't have any artificial intelligence on the back end that adjusts. It's just kind of some basic numbers that are put in there. But needless to say, something that is on the far left is worth less than something on the far right. So as we move it down the pipeline, your probable income and your potential income will become the same number. Does that make sense? But this also gives me an opportunity as I'm working in my sales business to be able to look at this and go, cool, I have 10 active listings right now. That's awesome. But I only have three that are looking to list in the next 90 days. So that means when those go under contract in the next few weeks, hopefully, I'm going to get those on. They're going to be sold and I'm going to be broke because I only have three people that are looking to list their house. So I may need to be working on putting more people in my cultivate phase, finding more people that are looking to list in the next 90 days. And I mean, honestly, carrying 10 or 15 listings is probably a really good idea at all times. And it depends on what scale of business you're at and everything, but 10 to 15 listings is not a bad thing to carry as a, sing as a solo agent business. And especially when uh, days on market starts getting longer, you're going to need something like that to be able to make sure. Uh, the reason we talk leads, listings, and leverage is because leads hopefully uh, lead to listings. Listings create more leads. So when you take listings, you get buyers. It's just kind of a chicken and the egg thing, okay? So we should always be looking for listings. Buyers will come. 
That's just kind of a reality of how the real estate market works. And also listings are leveraged. If you're working with 30 buyers, that is exhausting. It is absolutely flat exhausting. If you're working with 30 sellers, as long as you have a good communication plan in place, it's not that big a deal. Okay. So cultivate is going to be the first phase of your opportunities pipeline. That is, they're looking in the next 90 days or so. Appointment's going to be, I've set an appointment with them. It hasn't happened yet. Okay. Active is going to be, I actively have an agreement with them. As a buyer, it would be, I have a buyer representation. We're going to look at houses. As a seller, it is, I am, uh, I, we put their listing in MLS or, or we are preparing to put it in MLS and put this thing on the market. Under contract, it's pretty self-explanatory. That's going to be, is it an escrow? Are you negotiating it? All those kind of things. And then closed is, is pretty self-explanatory. Is it closed? Did it close? Now, mine says zero down there. That means zero closed this month. So when you pull them into the close phase, they will, uh, at the end of the month, they will disappear. And that is, that's what's supposed to happen. So you're only seeing what's going on for the month. So I'm actually click and cultivate real quick. And now that we're inside of here, you can see kind of the basically how opportunities work. So the phases were those big buckets. Now we're in the smaller pieces. And you can choose to organize this however makes sense for your business. If you don't have a system in place, just go with what the defaults are for now. And so, for example, that one, two, three, four main, uh, main Street for today's class, let's say I did have a conversation with them. You see, it's worth $9,750. Every time I talk to this person, that is the opportunity before me, $9,750. I want to get that to the finish line. So let's say we have a good conversation and we set an appointment. I can actually pull this up into the appointments. Fantastic. Let's say that I have a, a discussion with this person and they're ready to go under an agreement. Fantastic. I can move them into my active and I can get them here in a minute. Let's say uh, this person moved to active as well. Now I have no cultivates. It's great I'm getting these people further down the line. However, I have no cultivates. I'm going to have to work on that. But you can see this one's under appointment. We're just waiting to have an appointment. Awesome. Say they get done with that. We have an appointment and it all works out great. Now I can move them into active. I have an agreement and now we're moving forward. If you notice, each one of these phases has different stages that fall underneath it. So like staging, showing, negotiations, escrow, inspections, appraisal. Like I said, whatever makes sense for you, you can actually go in and edit these different stages within here. However, there are defaults. And then, of course, closed, when you move an opportunity to close, it's actually going to prompt you. And let me grab just a random opportunity. We'll take Patrick Stewart. We'll stick him into closed. It's actually going to prompt and ask you when it was closed. This closed data will then put it into that queue that at the end of the month, it'll roll off. And it'll actually keep track of that for you if you were to do a search later on and go, hey, what did I close in this month? And those sorts of things. So we do that. It's gone. Let's go back real quick to the opportunity itself. Now, if you can't find your opportunity, there's a couple ways to get to it. It is most likely under that cultivate. And hang on a second. Somehow I created two opportunities for one contact. That's okay. You can archive one of them. So you can actually click on the opportunity uh, and you can actually uh, archive the opportunity for one of those if you made two by accident. It's not a big deal. But when the listings pipeline, if you can't find your opportunity, there's two ways to get to it. You can either go to the phase that it's in and click on that and find it. Or you can go up to all opportunities and you can actually look at every single opportunity. This is like your master list. And then once you find that opportunity, just click into it and then it should bring you to a screen like this. Now, this was a cultivate. But let's say that we're getting further down the line with this particular opportunity. Actually, we did move it to active. That's right. And so we're moving it further down the line. It's actually active and staging. So we may be ready to do paperwork on it. We can start actually filling some details in. Well, some of the details that are on here are going to copy into DocuSign. So it's going to save you time if you can fill them in here. And there's some fields that will autofill based on things like Google Maps. And so you can save some time with that. 
you'll see this little pen. And sometimes on some browsers, it's hard to see. There's a little pen near the top right of each of the categories that are broken out. And so if I were to go into the one on property and I were to say United States, I'll just use the regional offices address. You see, it starts to do a lookup field on this. It's gonna look at my current location based on what it sees. And then as I type the address, it's gonna show me results that are close to it. If it is a new construction, all you have to do is just type the address in there, but it is gonna try to do a lookup for you to save you time. So I was able to do that. It grabbed, it grabbed my county, it grabbed my city and state. Fantastic, that made it super easy. I'm gonna hit save. And now you can see that that property address has been saved up there. We could down the, uh, go down here and add details from seller worksheet. Um, probably you don't need this as much, but these are things that you can do. You can also come with the general information and edit, edit this as well. And most of this is time frame. if you wanted to put those in, estimated close date. Uh, if you're taking a listing, you're not gonna know that yet. Um, and that if you are taking a listing, you probably are gonna know the list price at this point. So let's say you put 325, but actually it turns out it's 349. That's what y'all are going to list it for. Awesome. Go ahead and save that. And we're ready to go. Moving down the line, there's a few things that we also do have available as well. Uh, designs is connected to the listings here. And as you attach your listings, you can actually even do some pre-populated Facebook ads and designs with a couple of clicks, which is pretty cool. So we're not gonna we're not gonna talk about that really a whole lot, but I just want you guys to know that that's what that is available in there. The marketing that shows up in here is based on the opportunity phase. So if it's an active, it's going to show things like just listed. If it's in close, it's going to show things like just sold. If that makes sense, it's going to populate based on what phase it's in. But the most important thing you need to know is how in the heck do we get to documents? Okay. So if you have a DocuSign account connected, then uh, it should be like on mine here where it has the black box and says start a transaction. You can click on that and it's gonna pull you into DocuSign. If you have a dot loop account connected, it's gonna do the same thing. If you have dot loop and DocuSign connected, it's gonna give you a dropdown, okay? Because there are some people who do have both. So yours may look a little bit different in here. I can almost guarantee who here, their documents looks different than mine. Anybody? Yeah. Did anybody? Could I ask yes, a go for it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was switching uh, networks when you talked. Did you say that if we're in the, um, the listing that we could work through design straight through the listing? And if so, I mean, are you going to touch on that later? Or is that another class? No, that's, a, that's another topic. But no, the marketing tab gives you pre-populated designs based on your listing. Ah, uh, perfect. That's what I missed. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so Anthony, yours looks a little different. Okay, everybody in this room, I want you guys to know that what you all see on my screen is gonna be different for every market center because this is set up by your broker and your MCA. And you guys have different requirements locally. This is connected to Keller Williams and Hoover, Alabama. So this is gonna have Birmingham Association of Realtor Forms and uh, the Greater Alabama MLS Forms. Some of you may have gotten to this screen and it may be blank. There may be no form slots at all. And that's what, um, I'm just following along and running. Okay. Um, so if you came in and it was blank, go over here to the left where it says residential. You can click on this and you'll have a list of checklists that you can choose from if your page was blank. Some market centers will have like under the listing, they'll have like a residential listing, commercial, you know, multifamily, yada, 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 whatever it may be. Uh, these lists would be built out by your compliance team and they would be available. You have dot loop and DocuSign. Yeah, so Anthony, you probably get the dropdown when you go to start transaction, you get to select which one that it is. Now, some of you may be seeing uh, like how mine is built out here, the, these little teal DSs on some of these items. Now, what this means is when you click start transaction, Command is going to tell DocuSign an additional set of forms to automatically drop in the room. Okay. So for this, since this is a listing agreement, it's going to do some things like an MLS info sheet. 
It's going to do an MLS listing agreement and it's going to toss a recap in there, which for anybody, non-Alabama folks, a recap is a brokerage disclosure that's required. Everybody has to get it. Buyers, sellers, doesn't matter. If they're doing business with you, they've got to have a recap signed. These are required forms. And so the MCA in this market center has it set up. It used to be my market center. I used to be that MCA. But um, we had it set up so that when you hit start transaction, it actually pulls those forms in automatically. If it doesn't do that in your market center, that's just because of how they have it set up. And I'll be more than happy to work with your MCA or your compliance team to make this a little easier. The point of this is to kind of create a template based on the compliance checklist to make it easier for you guys. So say you have a listing and then we just want to start a transaction. Fantastic. Done. We've got all our forms we need. That is the objective of this. So if you want to hit start transaction, come on over into uh, DocuSign just so we can see what that looks like. Um, and we'll show you guys that. Now, this is in the DocuSign class. We're doing that tomorrow. We're doing DocuSign tomorrow. However, um, I am going to fill out a form real quick just so I can show you guys how it connects back to compliance. I'm actually going to apply a template. I clicked on the wrong thing. I'm not trying to split it. I'm going to apply a template to this uh, form right here. Let's see, standard listing agreement. I'm actually going to create an envelope for it real quick. Seller one. And I'm going to send this to myself and I'm going to sign it real quick so that it will appear in my DocuSign room. All right, it's got my name in there. Fantastic. Um, please sign, that's fine. So next, I will verify that the initials are in the correct locations on the form. Of course, before sending any forms, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you actually fill them out right. I didn't fill out anything other than just applying a template. So don't follow this, okay? <laughs> please, please fill out contracts before you actually send them to people. That would make a lot more sense. I am going to, okay, it's in my DocuSign. I'm gonna review document. Continue. I'm gonna sign it real quick. Yes, use my saved signature. Bloop, 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 finish. Okay, and then at about the next 10 seconds or so, we're gonna be able to actually see this inside the DocuSign room as a completed document. Give it just another second. Now, what command is actually gonna be able to do is command can see into this DocuSign room and because it can see in the stock sign room, we don't have to do any shuffling of downloading and re-uploading to be able to turn in compliance. It's going to be able to actually pull the document directly from this room and save you that time. So boom. So my form's in here. See this one that has a little check mark on it? If I were to go back to the opportunity, reload that page, most likely you've, you've left command, you've gone some different places in between this, but if you have to, you can reload the page. And then I can actually go down here to where it says attach files from, and then working folder, room documents, and attach that listing agreement. So it's going to be connected in there and be able to save you time on that. And then at this point, I can submit to my market center for review. If I've taken a listing, my market center probably says, oh, within the first 72 hours of the listing, you've got to turn in your signed listing paperwork typically what people will use uh, as a guideline. And so you do that, you can submit this, and then the compliance team will get it, and then they can uh, approve or reject your documents based on if they look good or not. Any questions around that? Yes, I'm going to get to the, the checklist here in just a minute. Now, when we're talking checklist, are we talking, we are talking the opportunity checklist, right? That is, that is on my agenda. Okay, awesome. Y'all are a quiet bunch today. How's the weather where you're at? Is it good? Is it pretty? Or are we glad for fall? It's amazing. It is amazing. Thank you. I'm so ready. I was so ready for fall. It's not even, it's not even funny. The it's hottest, amazing. wettest summer in Atlanta that I can remember. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
I mean, I, I've only lived here a year now, so I don't have any comparison on that. Although I figure it's not, it can't be too different than Birmingham. I mean, we're at the same longitude or whatever. So um, yeah. Uh, okay, I'm just I'm just making sure everybody's everybody's here and we're good. And, and you know. Patrick, yes, how did you get back from DocuSign back to Command? When I went to do my DocuSign, it made me log on it gave me a code to enter and all of that so i kind of lost you there yeah so it's just gonna it's gonna open a fresh tab in your browser and okay so I, just, I just clicked between the tabs as well got I did. it yeah okay so which if, special. if you want to get if you want to get real fancy you can hit control tab on a, a windows computer and skip between them but you know anyway you don't have to do that you can click too okay got it i'm back awesome Okay, so everybody everybody knows the basic of how this works. So we create an opportunity when they're in, the, in that 90 day window, at least. I've heard some people say, if they're six months out, I'm gonna go ahead and create an opportunity. Totally fine. It's what makes sense in your business, but you need to be tracking your future business. Um, there's a diagram that I went through uh, during the class successes under your command, where I draw this little sine wave and I break out all the different months. Um, if my remarkable, uh, Pen wasn't broken, which is a new one's coming in today. I would have drawn it for you guys. But the reality is, if you want to be able to pay your bills every month, you've got to track your future business. That's just that's the reality. And I'm just just being straight and upfront with you guys. Uh, 60, 90 days out is pretty typical. And we're going back into a normal real estate market. I know it sounds like it hurts. That, oh my gosh, sales are going down. Prices are flattening. It could not rise like this forever. If it, if it did, no one would be able to afford a house. At some point, there was good, prices were going to cap because it, it, there'd just be no way. And so so just, just bear in mind that the cycle is going to spread out a little. 60 days at minimum, more like 90 days. So, anywho. All right, so we know we, know we create an opportunity at that 90 days uh, or within that 90 day window. We, we put it in what phase it's in. If it's a cultivate, it's, we're following up with them. If it's an active, it's something we're starting a contract on. Once we uh, are ready to go, we can go to documents, start transaction. We do what we do in DocuSign. We bring it back in here. We turn it into compliance for our market center. And then they work with us with whatever process your local market center does for compliance review. Now, I'm not going to go through offers and commissions today. Most likely, your market center has a getting paid class that they teach where they will cover how to do this and how to properly turn it in. Like I said, you, us Georgia folks here, you can get paid at the attorney. And that's a different process than in Alabama or in Tennessee. But let's go back to opportunities. Let's talk a little bit more. I had questions around the uh, checklist. And so opportunity checklists are awesome. And I'm gonna send you guys kind of a, um, a guide to some of suggestions you can put in the opportunity checklist. And so one of the best examples of checklists I can think of are typically gonna be on the listing side. As you hold listings for longer days, you're gonna to have to communicate more often with your, with your sellers. This is a reality. And as you take more listings, you're gonna forget things. There's gonna be parts of the process you're gonna get busy and you're going to forget. And so one of the easiest ways to help that is say, in your active, create a checklist connected to the stage. So here's an example checklist, and I'll show you guys where you would edit that. But here's an example checklist I made a while ago. And so it does things on there like client cleanup. Has the client cleaned up the house? Yes or no? They have? Awesome. I've checked it off. Order photographer. I've sent the photographer out there. Fantastic. Made copies of the keys. Put a key and lockbox in the house. Review the signed paperwork to ensure it is all done. Made sure that the net sheet was filled out. It's a big deal in Alabama. I don't know about Georgia and Tennessee, but in Alabama, you can lose your license for not filling out a net sheet. Um, compose ad copy. So maybe you're doing a Facebook ad, and that's part of your what you're offering your seller. Have I taken care of that? Entered it into the MLS as a partial or provisional or whatever your MLS calls it. You know, it's that draft. Um, and you can put the make it live on MLS. So we're good to go now. It's within the marketing terms of the agreement. Fantastic. Let's make it active. Uh, and then put up signs. Okay. These are just some examples of things 
that would be on every single listing. Submit listing paperwork for compliance, create a Facebook post, schedule posts uh, for five days out, message all buyers slash leads on upcoming listings. So if you've got a list of buyers that you've been just kind of softly touching, hey, by the way, we've got a new listing over in Brookhaven. You should go check it out. It's 550,000, four bedrooms, three bathrooms, great backyard, uh, recently updated kitchen, those sorts of things. Final walkthrough before uh, listing it. Anyway, any of those pieces that may make sense, you can go ahead and add them to this. And it's going to create a checklist for you for each of the different stages. Now, the way I like to run it is like Monopoly. And so do not pass go, do not collect $200. You cannot move something from one opportunity stage to the next one until all the checklist items are done. Because when you do, it has a different checklist. So we went from zero to 15, zero to three, because it's in a different phase. Get feedback from showing agents. Open house, if you've done an open house yet, put final walkthrough on there again. It could be, have you reverse prospected through your MLS? Have you reached out to other agents? Have you done an agent open house? Whatever the current strategies are that are working, you could add those in there as well. Could even be your weekly check-ins. The other thing I want to bring the attention to is, is also this client update. Are you guys curious what this little check mark is? I usually get a lot of questions about that. Command a while back added this red circle that says client updates all, and I got all kinds of questions about it, and then, it, then people kind of forgot about it. Can you also put referrals on a checklist? 100%, anything you need to be reminded about, I would say, put it on there. Be careful how you word these though, because this client update is another powerful tool you can use for communicating with your sellers. And so when you check client update, when I check off that item, if the updates are turned on at the end of the day or whatever time that I set their updates to go out, they're gonna get an email saying I did that. Okay? So anything you want your seller to know about, you can set up as a client update. Are there checklist templates? No, and I'm gonna give you guys uh, some suggestions. I have a spreadsheet that came from a mastermind that was really good, and I'll do it in the follow-up email that'll just give you guys some ideas. Do know that this mastermind had a lot of agents from California, so there may be some things in there that are completely unapplicable for you guys. So just make sure that you look at it through the lens of your state and, um, and that, but it's a pretty good list to start from. But if we go to the top, we go to edit stages. And this is where you're gonna, you're gonna edit those, those different checklist items. Now, whatever you put in here, if you've already created an opportunity, it's not gonna update what's in your current opportunities already. It'll create what, it'll be what's in new opportunities. So this is moving forward, not moving backwards. Does that make sense? The different stages are in here. And like I said, you can create stages if you want. You can add a stage. You can call it whatever you want. Uh, I'll just do this as just an example. You can, add, you can go ahead and add checklist items to this um, if you would like. Uh, uh, a good time. Uh, buy something fun. I don't know. I'm just throwing some items on here. And then you could save that on your checklist and then boom, there it is. Any of the checklists you want to edit, you just click on them and it'll pull up the little edit modal there and you'll be able to add the different checklist items to it. And then you can mark if they are by default a client update or not. Now, client updates, given the purpose of them, they are an opt-in sort of communication. So you do have to turn them on per opportunity. That's why they added that red little circle. So if I was going to turn it on for this opportunity here, I would just go in here and I would go to client updates and then I would turn it on and say when I want those emails going out. 
And Patrick, on those updates, can you change the theme? I guess, okay, I see, okay, never mind. Yeah, at this point, there aren't a whole lot of, it's, there aren't a whole lot of things you can do with the update email itself. It's gonna be pretty simple. I don't know why am I showing broken images on the screen? It's not how the actual email comes out. But in the top left, it's gonna have your Market Center logo. Top right, it's gonna have your picture and your, your name and number. It's gonna have the client's name. We checked off the following items. It's gonna put their property address. And then it is literally going to name the items based on how you had them in the checklist. So you may not wanna put something in there, uh, call my stupid seller and tell them to uh, do a price reduction and make that a client update because it'll say, I did the following tasks on your behalf, call my seller and my stupid seller and do a price reduction. So just know they're gonna see exactly what that is. Any questions around those client updates? Any ahas around them? Can you, you just, me? I'm sorry, can you tell me how to get to the client updates? Um, how do you get to that screen you're on? One yes, absolutely. Sorry, I need a sip of water. Um, so you're in an opportunity, any opportunity. In the top right here, you have this client updates. You click on that, and this is going to be where you control whether they're turned on or off. Gotcha. Thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure. Now, you can add additional people to it that aren't parties to the opportunity. Let's say, for example, just as an example, you have an estate situation and there's like six kids involved and one person may be the executor. So they may be the person who's signing all the paperwork, but everybody wants to be in the loop. So they want to know, maybe it's a big piece of property. They're going to send somebody out there to, to bushwhack it and, and do other, you know, other work on the property. You may cre actually create those checklist items for that specific property and then add those different family members. So when those go out, they go to everybody. That may save you some headaches in a situation like that. There may also be a situation, maybe you're working a short sale or with a bank or an investor and you've got multiple people involved, you can add them as well. So you can get real creative with this if you would like, but if not, you can keep it as simple as just, just letting your seller know, hey, by the way, I put the lockbox on the house. I did this on your behalf. Right. So what else do we have in that? Create opportunities, went through DocuSign. All right, we'll do color-coded uh, opportunity tags here in just one second. Any more questions around checklists, stages, phases, any of that kind of stuff? Because before we move, I'll show you guys a fun little thing and then we just kind of wrap up for the day. Can you also use it for buyers as relates to utilities? You could. That is actually a really good idea. Absolutely. I just tend to lean in. Sellers seem like you have more standard things that you have to do kind of on every transaction at the different phases, but you could definitely get creative with that. Another checklist item, not a client update, but a checklist item I would add to everyone is... Um, asking for referrals. I would add that at several places within your pipeline. The best time to ask for a referral from someone is when you are working with them. And then the second best time is after you're done working with them. And then the third best time is any other time you talk to them. But your, your emotional proximity is gonna be highest when you're working with them. And that's where you're gonna have the least friction about, hey, do you happen to know anybody who's looking to buy or sell right now? That, that's when you're going to have the easiest time with that. You can add it to the checklist. Okay, so you may be noticing these little color-coded things in here. You may have noticed everything else in my pipeline is very generic and bland, but we got these little color-coded pieces. So I will send this to you guys, but go on to write this down. You can write this down, and I'll show you how to do it. Purple means closing entity. Red means home warranty company which now that we are getting back into a less sellerish market, home warranties are probably going to make a comeback. Yellow is type of financing. Green is going to be your lender. Orange is going to be your lead source. Essentially, what we're going to start doing, and I would recommend that you start doing this, is tracking all the people you work with 
and where your business came from. I oftentimes have people ask me uh, and say, well, I track all my lead sources on the contact side. Well, that's great, but how many of those leads directly translated into business? And they have a much harder time tracking that. They also have a hard time having a conversation like, um, well, I know I work with this vendor a lot, but I don't know how often I work with them. And I'm like, okay, so you've got a client event coming up. Would you like for them to pay for some of it? Sure. But I, I, I mean, I'd have to go back through all my closings to figure out how many closings was with them. Would it be valuable to you guys if you could pull that up with like two button clicks? So opportunity tags are a way to sort opportunities. Uh, purple would be, uh, if you're in a title state, it would be like your closing and title company. If you're an attorney state, it'd be your attorney. So I say closing entity, whoever, whoever, whoever that might be in your state. So going back to all opportunities, this is a fun conversation right here you can have. And I'm not advocating for this particular um, bank, by the way. I just happen to have several tags on them because I've played around with this quite a bit. And so um, you can go to all opportunities and I can filter. And then I can go down here to my tags since I've created these and I could say First Bank. Let's just say I do business with First Bank a lot. Let's say that I've worked with several of my clients, gotten pre-qualified through them, had loans. Okay. I can very easily go in here and then I can look at all the opportunities I have with First Bank on. So I can very quickly, if I wanted to, I could even print out this screen and I call up my person at First Bank. I could be like, what's going on, Jennifer? How are you doing today? Glad things are going great. Hey, I've got a client event coming up. It's gonna be a family fun event, an outdoor thing. And one of the things we're wanting to do is we want to have a bouncy house. It's gonna be $500 for us to rent it for the day. And I was curious if you wanted the opportunity to get out in front of these people, plus some of their friends, if you will cover the cost of the bouncy house. You will be surprised how many lenders or vendors will be like, oh, heck yeah, I'm all over it. Now, you may have to work out a special thing. They may have to pay that specific vendor directly. They probably won't pay you. However, that is a great way to be able to, to leverage those relationships and give them value back as well. Would you add the vendors a contact? You could. It wouldn't necessarily apply to this particular strategy, though. Additionally, like I said, we don't just want to track where, how many leads we got from a certain source. We want to find out how many leads closed from a certain source. To me, that's, that's important as well. And so we could take these filters off. And one of the ones I created was BNI. So if anybody is familiar with BNI, BNI is a networking organization. It's not a real estate related thing, but usually a real estate agent seat is a really good thing to be in in BNI. And so uh, essentially, the, it's, a, it's a networking group where there's only one industry of or one, yeah, one industry of each type in the group. So there's one realtor, one title person, one attorney person, one pest control person, one promotional products person, one auto repair person, and you pass referrals between each other. Okay, it's a pretty cool thing. Um, well, it's great. I'm getting referrals from my BNI group. I'm tagging them in my database, but how many of them turned into closed business? Awesome. I can look and see I got three closings from BNI. So then I can have the conversation with myself or my team at the end of the year while well, I'm spending X number of dollars a month for my membership. I'm spending this time. Is it, is it well served or can I be making more money doing something else? Could be the same for Zillow leads, Realtor leads, Ojo, Off City, any of that kind of stuff. You could be able to track that as well. Any questions around this? Do y'all like this? Is this valuable at all? Okay. Yes, very valuable. Good deal. Yes. I'm going to tell you it's fun too if you're growing a team. Is that Cahaba Manor Trail and Pelham? It is. I'm like, hang on a second. Kelly, where are you at? Oh, really? Well, we used to live there. That, that was the house we lived in before we moved to Atlanta. I still own... I still own a rental property on uh, Cahaba Manor Trail. So anyway, our house there, we didn't sell it. We just kept it. So small world, <laughs> small world. So uh, so if your mom has a problem with uh, my renters, y'all just, just let me know. They're, they're good people though. Uh, 
They're good people, small family. Um, so if you want to create those, all you have to do is when you're inside of an opportunity, and actually I'm going to check some, they may have updated this. I cannot remember if this is part of the updates or not. Let's see. Um, no. So you can create the tags from inside of here, but you can't color code them. Okay. I don't know why this is one of those things they haven't quite updated yet. You can create the tags in here and then you can color code them. My personal opinion is the easiest way to actually create these tags is to go into your settings and go to your opportunity tags. And then just think about all the vendors you work with on a regular basis or lead sources or referral sources, and just go ahead and create these opportunity tags here on the back end first, because here it will let you color code and edit them. Now, the reason I do the colors is because maybe we're looking for the whole rainbow. There's a team, um, George Kelly has uh, REPG, it is a real estate team out of greater, uh, or out of, uh, where's he at again? Is he in Pennsylvania? I believe he's in Pennsylvania. And his team sells about 150 units a year. His admin came up with this color-coded system. And part of the reason they did it is so that they could look at their opportunities and make sure they had all their vendors booked for the different transactions. So if they were missing an attorney, it made them go, whoa, hang on a second. Have we talked to the attorney yet and gotten it set up? So it kind of gave him a dashboard view as well. So you can go in here and can you actually edit those, create those yourself. Okay, so what do we cover today? So we talked about best practices for, on your workflow from contact to contract, talked about how to create and manage opportunities, talked about opportunity checklists and the uh, client updates. We went through some DocuSign uh, rooms basics. We're doing the heavy lifting tomorrow, guys. So you'll see most of that tomorrow. And then we kind of went through how you turn in compliance. Um, action items, if you haven't already added yourself to your database, do that now. It's a very critical thing to have. Uh, create a test opportunity and fill it out. Uh, send uh, that contract yourself and sign it. We'll do that tomorrow as well. Add a signed contract to your compliance. Don't submit it for compliance. Just leave it parked there. Note where the submit button is if you need it. All right, pop quiz. Let's see if everybody was paying attention. I think, I think you guys are going to win. Yesterday, everybody did okay on the pop quiz. But let's see what we have here. So, so what's the best time to create an opportunity? That's question number one. What is the correct opportunity workflow? Question number two. And can opportunities be accessed from mobile? I'll give you guys a second to think about those. I need some Jeopardy music to go along with that. I need to, I need to get some something queued up. All right, we'll give everybody about 30 more seconds. Right, five, four, three, two, and okay. So let's see what we have. So, what is the best time to create an opportunity? Um, the two options that you guys picked were anytime a new lead's added to your database, or when someone has a high level of intent to buy or sell in the next ninety days. So, the the second one is not complete. It's not flat out wrong. Uh, your opportunities will get way too full. That's the biggest reason. You're, it's going to be hard to tell who has a high level of intent. You're just going to end up with a lot of noise. So I would recommend the 90 days. So most of you guys got that right. That's awesome. Uh, what is the correct opportunity workflow? And um, you guys, uh, you guys know that. So you meet someone uh, uh, new with a real estate need, uh, create an opportunity follow up. Y'all did great on that. Um, can opportunities be accessed for mobile? Everybody wins. Yes, 100%. Absolutely can. It's, it's going to show up on your screen on uh, Command Mobile, and buyers and uh, sellers are going to show up together. So just know there's not a listing pipeline and a buyer pipeline. They, it just puts them together, and it tells you if it's a listing or a buyer. And awesome. All right, so what did you learn today that you're going to put into practice immediately? Feel free to go, come off mute and share.
the okay. color opportunity bags. I love I'll that. use those. I love it. Thank you for sharing. That's a that's a good one. I like those. Who else? I had several things. I've been an agent for a while, but I always like to jump in the class because you always have a great nugget. I did not know about that marketing tab. I know that's another class, but I like that. And we always use opportunity tags, but what we never used was specific marketing for an um, for a client event. Remembering who um, we worked with, Kel uh, Campbell and Brandon, or who we worked with, O'Kelly. Okay. I love that. Yeah, just put the squeeze on them. Just get some marketing dollars out of them. They'll do it. They'll do and it. there was one more. I have a very comprehensive list, but um, for our team, I do like the idea of using a checklist and command so that the agent that's working on each of the properties can actually see the where we're at instead of asking, what did I do? What did I not do? Absolutely. That is a, that is a big one. Thank you for sharing. Those are great. We'll get one more. We will wrap this up. Don't be shy. Or not. Opportunity checklist. Man's new. Opportunity checklist. Okay, so do me a favor, guys. eval.r19zoom.com. The link I just put in there. Leave us a review. Let us know how we're doing. And uh, of course, we like to know if there's any improvements. We've worked really hard through this content to make sure that we're delivering very relevant pieces. I wish I could teach you guys everything in command in like an hour and a half. Like I wish I could. Um, I could come into your market center. We could sit down for a week and we would still probably be delving the depths of things that I can do. So take away what you can and any questions you have, feel free to reply back when I send out the recording of this. And then, like I said, tomorrow, and I will give you guys a link for that. We'll be doing DocuSign Basics, same time, different link. And so if you've got questions around that, we can definitely come in and do it. So thank you so much, guys. I appreciate everyone here. And until next time, you guys stay connected, be joyful, go live your greatness. Y'all have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.